Hey, this is Pastor Lachey. I just wanted to take a few moments today, being such a very special day, to acknowledge mothers. Moms everywhere are so important. They're vital to our existence. In fact, without mothers, we wouldn't be here. So I want to salute the uh, mothers because you've done a wonderful job in not only bearing children, but raising children. And even if you're in the midst of that process, you are to be commended. Um, as a father and as a male, I have a limited view as to what it means to walk in the shoes that you have. Um, I can observe, you know, I had a mother as well who's gone on uh, to be with the Lord. And many of us have remembrances and celebrations of what our moms did. But what I want to do is recognize who moms are. Um, sometimes we will attribute the role of mom to that being of someone who serves others, who nurtures, who is the cook and the chief and the, and the household uh, manager. All of those might be true in some instances, but there are also people who um, carry on the responsibility of carrying spiritual weight. They carry on the responsibility of, of uh, making choices and decisions that help govern people's lives that literally change the world. And, and that's found in mothers. I thank God for mothers and I thank God for the Mothers of Grace for the Nation's Church, young and old alike. Um, your wisdom speaks and you're the virtuous woman that's talked about in the book of Proverbs. Your children rise up and call you blessed. And we thank God for each and every one of you. So we salute you this day and we want you to enjoy your special time. Happy Mother's Day. Hallelujah, we love you, Jesus. We lift your name, God. We adore you. We thank you for being everything that we need. So we praise you. We worship you with our hearts and minds. Because you deserve our praise. You deserve our worship. So we sing a love song unto you, Lord. Because you deserve it. And we appreciate you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord Jesus. Our hearts cry, be magnified in this your holy temple, in this your holy place, and we will rise to Zion. This your holy temple. In this your holy place, and we will rise to Zion's height to praise and glorify, unified. Oh, how we love you! Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we worship Oh, how we worship Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, how we love you. We praise you. Oh, how we praise you. Lord, we worship you. Oh, how we worship you. Oh, Lord. Lord, be magnified. be magnified 
in this your holy temple, in this your holy place, we will rise to Zion's high, to praise and glorify. it does. Oh, how we love you. We praise you with the fruit of our lips. We give thanks unto you, Lord, for you are good. You are great. You are wonderful. Hey. Oh, on high. Oh, how we, we worship you, oh God. Oh, Lord. Yes, oh Jesus, we love oh, you. We There's you. nobody greater than you. Oh, how we, we praise you. your name, oh God. Oh, how we, we worship you, you Jesus. There's nobody like you. That's why we give you all the glory and the praise. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, we bless your name, God. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. There's no one greater than you, Lord. We lift your great name. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I adore your name, Jesus. I lift you. Adore you. I lift you and adore you. I lift you and adore your name. Your name is wonderful. Oh, how we love you. And we praise your name. Lord, you. Oh, how we worship Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Oh, how we love I praise you from the depths of my soul. Oh, how we I praise you with all my might. Oh, how we worship I worship you, Jesus. I worship oh, you, Lord. Lord. Yeah. Oh, how we love you. I love you, Jesus. Oh, how we pray. I praise you, Jesus. Oh, how we worship, oh, how we worship you. Oh, I worship you. Say, ba, ba, ba. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I worship you. Lord. I love you, Lord. I worship 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 you
worship you. I worship you, Jesus. I can't help but to lift your name, Jesus. I can't help but to adore you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord. You're mighty. You're mighty. You're mighty, God. Yes, you are. There's nothing too hard for you. So we worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Almighty God. Because there's nobody like you. There's nobody greater. There's nobody stronger. You're mighty, you're mighty, you're mighty, you're mighty. So we lift your name, hallelujah. And we give you glory and honor, Lord. Because nobody greater, nobody stronger, nobody wiser. And we know that there's nothing too hard for you. But we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. As we worship you, as we lift you, and as we exalt your name, we call you mighty, we call you worthy, we call you lovely. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Praise God, we're going to get right into the message today. We are in a series entitled Kingdom Restoration. This message that we're going to be looking at today um, addresses an issue that many of us have as it relates to our Christianity. You know, speaking of, of, of our character, speaking of the things that are expected of us as Christians, there's some distinctions in the Bible when Jesus talked to his disciples about being part of his kingdom. At one point, they questioned um, who would have the greatest seat in the kingdom. There was another instance where he had sent out disciples and they came back excited because they were able to cast out devils and represent the kingdom. And he says, don't be so excited over the physical aspect of the kingdom as much as you should be considering the fact that we're worthy or that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, giving us access or keys to the kingdom. We're going to talk about keys today. We're going to talk about how keys grant us access into places. This example, of course, is that of a physical key um, to open a door. This would have to be a pretty big lock in order for us to utilize this as a key to gain access. Uh, now we live in such an age or an era where most keys are electronic or there's the digital age where we have access through technology and over the internet to unlock doors. The Spirit of God is also the tool or the instrument by which we have access into the kingdom of God. So we're talking about kingdom. The church's charge is to uh, reestablish God's kingdom or to restore the kingdom principles in the earth so that as Jesus' return, he can sit in his rightful place on the throne. And so we're going to pray and jump into the word. Father, we thank you for our time in the word today. It's another day that you've made. We're rejoicing and we're glad in it. We are glad to be alive. 
glad to have life and health and strength and all the things that pertain to life and to godliness. Speak through me today. Let your word and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, but let it inspire someone to advance your kingdom, to grow in your kingdom, to be hungry and thirsty in your kingdom for after the hunger and the thirsting, there should be a filling, Father. And so we ask for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Get your Bibles and let's go right into Matthew, the 16th chapter. Matthew, the 16th chapter. It helps us to know context of this. Jesus is talking to um, the Pharisees as well as his disciples. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, these are religious groups of people who are questioning Jesus's authority and his um, royalty, his identity as the king um, of heaven. Now think for a moment about the fact that Jesus never proclaims himself as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but others recognize his deity. They recognize his royalty. They recognize his regality. And that's the way that we should be. We should have the residue of Jesus Christ all over us, given that we have access or we've been given the keys to the kingdom. Let's look at scriptures um, that, that deals specifically with that. This is in the 13th verse. I'm going to forego the first few verses, get to the 13th verse of Matthew, the 16th chapter. And it says that when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I, the son of man is? He says, who do you hear people saying that I am? In 14th verse, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others still say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus questions them and he says, what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? Now, this is a question of great proportion because Jesus is now literally going in and challenging the character of those who say that they're kingdom citizens. Those who now have identified and walked with Jesus through a large portion of his ministry time here on the earth. In fact, this is coming up on the end of his ministry on the earth which means that they've seen him. They watched him grow. They've seen him in the community. They know of his attributes and his character, and they know that it was something really different and peculiar about him from the beginning. John the Baptist, who was his cousin, had recognized the Holy Spirit in, in Jesus Christ when they met in, in the wombs of their mothers. And then when Peter was called upon by Jesus to drop his nets and to follow him. Jesus had such a compelling representation of kingdom authority that Peter did just that. And he went and he compelled his brothers as well and, and his cousins and then others. And so what I'm driving toward as relates to keys to the kingdom is that Jesus is the primary key and access to get into the kingdom. Keys grant us the availing access to treasures, places that need to be locked, or places that aren't readily accessible to everyone except those who have a key. So when we look at the scriptures centered around the keys of the kingdom, and I'm going to give you some keys, I want us to think about the fact that we're looking for the access point. Many of us have closed doors in our lives and we have situations in our lives where we don't have access to the things that we feel we need or our goals or our objectives or our mission in life is, is somewhat um, blocked up or stopped because of barriers or doors that stand between us and where it is that we feel that we should be and we need the key. We need the key because God tells us that there are doors that he will close that no man can open. And then there are doors that he will open that no man can shut. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus is the doorway or the access point by which we get to God and everything that concerns God and us. Our relationship with God is centered around the key and the access of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the next verse, it says this, when Jesus asked them that in verse number 15, Peter, Simon Peter, he responds and he says, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. Jesus replied to him in verse number 17, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for it was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are now Peter. He goes from being Simon to Peter. 
One of the things that I've learned to be true about God is that whenever we encounter his power, his kingdom authority and his kingdom power, our name is changed. Our reputation is changed. Um, God calls us who we really are, not who everybody else sees us as. You see, everybody saw Simon Peter as the son of Jonah, and he um, was recognized as that in his community. But when Jesus heard him uh, yielding to the presence of the Holy Spirit, And giving the truth through that revelation of who Jesus is, he gives him his rightful name, and that name is Peter. And Peter is from Petra, and Petra means rock. And Jesus calls him the rock. He calls him a foundational stone. He calls him a platform by which he can build all of the principles of teaching the kingdom on earth in. In this verse number 18, he says that you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He says, I'll build on this rock or platform of revelation. And because of revelation, you now have access to the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'll translate that. Whatever you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven, and whatever you loose or or lock up on earth will be locked up in heaven. I know we quote that scripture in prayer. Intercessors love it. We talk about whatever you bind on earth is bound and whatever you loose on earth is loosed. And we we don't know the context oftentimes of how relevant it is that when Jesus was speaking to Peter, he was speaking to us. He says, I'm going to build the entire church on this dynamic of your relationship with me, your revelation, your understanding of who I am, the key, the door, the access point to the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to give that to you. And as a result of having that, you now have power through the kingdom access to bind and to loose, to stop and to allow, to permit and to block. And when we look at kingdom access, we look at the keys of the kingdom, we many times miss the opportunity to utilize those keys because we're stuck on the things of the earth and the kingdoms of this world as opposed to the kingdom of heaven. I mean, think for a moment, if everything that happens, happens first in spirit realm, we then have the authority in the spirit realm to call things that be not as though they were, so that by the time they manifest in the natural realm, we have what God intended for us in the first place. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all things, all these things will be added unto you, added to you which means that you primarily have everything you need, but things that will be added to you will come as a result, according to scripture, as a result of seeking first the kingdom and access to the kingdom. Let's look what the scripture says further. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind is bound. Whatever you loose is loose. Verse number 20 says this. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Because Peter's revelation was so revealing, this was going to bring about a threat because the kingdoms of the world or the kingdom that was already established was now being threatened. When we look at keys and having access, those on the other side of the door always have to feel somewhat threatened when you have the authority to come in and out. I want to share with you some keys. I'll I'll try to get through as many of them as possible in today's message. And then next week we can pick up because I want to talk about kingdom codes in the next message. But in this one, I want to talk about the keys of kingdom principles. There's some key principles for kingdom citizens that gives us access to God. It gives us the power and the authority that comes with our citizenship of both being kingdom citizens and being citizens on the earth. We have dual citizenship. Kingdom principle number one, the kingdom of God is a dominion or domain that has a king who has all sovereignty, all sovereignty, even over other kings. And the reason that's important to know is because if we look at kingdoms in contrast to one another, one kingdom might be more uh, uh, powerful than another kingdom based on their military prowess. One kingdom may be more powerful than another because of its economic uh, power. One kingdom may be more powerful or more threatening than another because of its population numbers. 
I think for a moment about how the kingdom of God is a kingdom that has a dominion or a domain of a king that has sovereignty over everything. That's a key principle to understand. Peter understood that. Second key principle that I want to share with you is that in this kingdom, in order to become a citizen of the kingdom, you must be born again. There has to be a repentance in order to enter into the kingdom of God. You see, we must be born again to get into the kingdom because when the kingdom was originally established, sin entered into the hearts of men and then our access was no longer available and we were thrown from the garden and then and no longer had access directly to the kingdom. So the kingdom is being restored through our repentance. Keep that in mind because if something in your life is not coming to pass like you think it should, it could be because you're not operating inside of the kingdom's gates. And in order to get inside the gates of the kingdom, there must be repentance and there must be forgiveness of sin. Kingdom principle number three. The core message of the kingdom, the the music that plays in the kingdom. I got a chance to go to Disney quite a few times when my kids were coming up. Disney, both land and world. And, And there's this music that plays within the magical kingdom of Disney. And the music is everywhere, no matter where you go, the bathroom, the, 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 the restaurants, the, the rides, there's this constant music playing and there's music that sets atmosphere and it sets a tone and it sets an ambience for that kingdom, that magical kingdom that we know of as Disney. Well, the kingdom of God, this is principle number three, it also has a core message or a core medley that is constantly played. And that is the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Matthew, the fourth chapter, 4 and 23, as well as 9 and 35, all point toward the message of Jesus Christ being the son of God, being the savior of the world, being the great Messiah, being the holy one of Israel. I mean, you can think of songs yourself that go on all constantly that establishes his kingship and his authority. That's the reason for praise and worship. That's the reason for songs of devotion so that the music is constantly playing, creating the environment and the atmosphere by which we can distinguish this kingdom from any other kingdom in the earth. We know Disney because of its magical happiness and excitement and the joy that comes when people are in the Disneyland parks. But when we are citizens of the kingdom of God, we should always hear the sound of the kingdom, which is the message of the gospel and the truth of Jesus and who he really is. That's a key element, a very key principle. Third one. So number four, number four, this kingdom is available to those who are aware of their extreme spiritual poverty, which means that when we recognize that we're not the king, we have access to the king. When we recognize that spiritually we're impoverished, we're broken, we're, we're damaged, and, we're, and we need to be repaired and restored, that gives us access to the kingdom. That humility the recognition of the fact that we tried it, it didn't work, and we need God, so we're yielded and we submit to the authority of the king. That's an important key principle in the kingdom. And then um, I'll just give you five today. The fifth one, the fifth one, is that the kingdom is a place of refuge for those who are persecuted. It's a place of refuge for those who are downtrodden, it's the rejected, it's the, the disenfranchised, the one who just didn't fit in, the one who, don't, who doesn't belong, the one who they've always talked about, the one who was always left out, the one who was never uh, remembered or respected or honored. Um, that's what the kingdom of God avails us as the opportunity to be a part of God's family. And so in looking at these five key principles, these five kingdom elements helps us to understand what Jesus granted to Peter when he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. And I will give you keys. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. So as we've studied and looked at various scriptures, I want to leave with this thought. There are various rankings of authority in the kingdom of God, but none of them supersede God himself. The joy of having access to the kingdom is having access to the king. The joy or the 
the dignity associated with being a kingdom representative and an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven is in that we have access to him. Not in so much that we're deserving of it or that we're worthy of it, but that through the grace of God, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and the giving of the keys of the kingdom through a revelation of who he is, we have access. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray that as this, this message and this study is being taught throughout this month by me and the other teachers on Wednesday nights, that you get a clear understanding of where you fit in the kingdom and how we have keys and we have access that we may or may not be utilizing right now. There's the passcode of being able to repent and ask for forgiveness, obtain grace and mercy, and have access to the throne of God. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that's in your word. Even today's message leaves us hungry and thirsty for more, causes us to think about the hundreds of times that we've heard the word kingdom quoted in scripture. What does it really mean to us and how do we fit in? And what is the access point for us with the keys of the kingdom and access to the things that you have for all of your kingdom citizens? Father, I pray for that man or that woman who's now embarking upon the journey to dig deeper and to search your word and to come to understand the truths that's associated with your word. Forgive us for taking things for granted and thinking that a church membership was access to the kingdom. And grant us, Father, access through the spirit and the revelation and knowledge of who your son Jesus is. This we pray in his name. Amen.